you're getting better Cause the nurse said you would This place is feeling friendly The way that it should The people that built it must have understood At the children's hospital we care for kids and fun clothing for active men and women. Experience the lightning bolt of fashion. Visit the Dance Center of London and come away electrified. BCTV! Good morning. Unfortunately, I've been forced to cancel a short, sharp interview I had planned with $65 million friar. His lip, lips are sealed today, and perhaps it's just as well. And his and my intervention may have encouraged bargaining to take place in a reasonable matter between the government and the BC Government Employees Union. But John Fryer's lips are sealed for the moment. Now, also this morning, I'm going to give you my opinion of a great election goodie which Social Credit got, as they seemed to be working up to issue a writ. And that, of course, was the happenstance of the Warren Commission and its seven extra seats. This morning, too, a bit of a varied program, we're going to tell you the story of a true innocent victim of a federally chartered insurance company which cannot pay its claims. And there are about a million dollars in claims throughout British Columbia, which kind of parallel the experience of a man you're going to meet this morning. His name is Doug Lane, and he's from Delta. And he's out 11,000 bucks, even though he knew he was fully covered by a proper insurance. And many other people are suffering too, insurance agents, body shops, and the rest. For further variety this morning, I'm going to give you a little bit of a walkabout I did on the students lining up at the University of British Columbia, 25,000 of them. And one of the angles I take in the program is to try and find out what kind of political awareness there is among today's generation of university students. And you'll be surprised to find that you can't find a left winger in a carload lot. Ain't that funny? First, however, for my little editorial on the Warren Commission at all, after Oh, and by the way, we're going to have a free-for-all this morning, too, after the break. I would say, and I've only been back a couple of weeks now, that it's a 50-50 proposition as to whether or not uh, Premier Bennett will issue an election writ by Monday or Tuesday of next week. The polls probably tell him that he's 50-50, the parties are 50-50, but that he, partly because of Barrett's low-level visibility, is probably ahead of Barrett in personal popularity. And the other indicators are, of course, is that the election goodies, or what can pass for election goodies, are dripping out regularly day by day. The mortgage bonus mortgage plan isn't bad at all. Bad at all. It is an interest-free loan of a maximum of about $6,500 for three years and a certain attractiveness about it. And, of course, in the normal Bennett style, it is what he calls quaintly off-budget money. Technically, it won't cost the taxpayer much, unless, of course, inflation rates go up, and by the end of three years, it'll have cost the government from $50 million to $400 million. He, of course, and all of us, in fact, are counting on a measure of deflament without unemployment. Then there's a big job creation thing supposedly to be announced today. Then there was the 
the rebirth of another plan for the 450 acres over Kala and Burnaby. But the best uh, scenario that might bring about an election, I still think, is a confrontation with the BCGEU. However, one of the reasons Fryer is not appearing this morning is because he and the government, I do believe, have a sense of cautious optimism about a settlement. Now, the reason I wanted to get at Fryer this morning in a nice, pleasant uh, way and pure, no four-letter language was because from coast to coast he accused me of lifting his $65 million job creation no wage increase offer out of context of my original interview last week. That is not correct. I did not lift it out of context, John. It was clean as a whistle when I asked you and when you made your $65 million job offer and no increase, I said, do you really realize what you have said? Say it again. But the biggest election goody of all, and I hope this doesn't upset Commissioner Daryl Warren too much, is the happenstance and the convenient timing now for the government's plans of the recommendation of seven new multiple member ridings, not new, expanded into multiple members in British Columbia. It couldn't have come at a better time for Bennett, especially if the polls up country support him. It could mean five, six or seven social credit seats and even if Bennett is only running 50-50 in popularity broadly overall, the government in power is given a built-in advantage of six or eight points on an election called at their particular moment in time. So while in no way would I attack the integrity of dear Mr. Warren, and he happens to be a man I've known for many long times, I find his report very difficult to swallow. One of the reasons is quite simple. Who needs another seven members of the legislature? We've already got 57 for 2.4 million people. Who needs them? And while he will tell you, as he does in his report, that uh, the cost of the seven members is only a mere $640,000 a year, what we need is redistribution. There isn't any argument that Richmond should have two members or that some of the others should have two members, but it should be done overall with the one good recommendation that Daryl Warren makes, the only one he is himself is really enthusiastic about, and that's the Permanent Electoral Commission. Three-man independent Permanent Electoral Commission to go through the redistribution on a fair and sane basis, taking some time to do it. There's another thing which kind of annoys me. His recommendation is, and it will be in the act if they push it through, chop off Gracie's finger. And he says about that, subject to investigation, if any, by the ombudsman, it is time to end the bitter partisan attacks. That's the allegations of gerrymandering and Gracie's finger in that particular writing. And then Warren says, if gerrymandering did take place, the boundary line should be changed. If it did not, the constant debilitating and unproductive debate, which is harmful to the political process, is unfair to the last commissioner, that was Larry Eckhart, and to the member of the Legislative Assembly accused of political interference. That was Gracie. So what he says is, certainly it's a bit of a mess and it caused a little bit of trouble and it will look neater and nicer if it's chopped off. But that's kind of, you know, pushing the whole Gracie's finger thing underneath the rug. There are, the legislation has obviously been rushed through and if I were Bennett, I would regard the Warren Commission as manner from heaven. Now, I've tried to understand the mathematical formula in this report. I vaguely understand it, and the only thing that stands out is that if it were equally applied throughout the province, two social credit writings would be wiped out. Columbia, that's Chabot, who knows nothing about this act by his own statements, and South Peace River. So, if Bennett goes, if, for instance, the NDP are to filibuster on this legislation, for the additional seven members of the riding, Bennett can sit back and say, the business of the people of British Columbia is being obstructed. Let's go uh, to the polls. I think he'd be, have, he'd be in a far better position, well, from a point of view of, I suppose, political virginity, if he went, if he goes on the present ridings and then establishes the permanent electoral, electoral commission. 
That's the way I look at it anyway. Now, I'm going to have a free-for-all later. What am I going to do next? I've lost the lineup. Where's the lineup? The innocent victim of an insurance company after the break. This truck is about to be sold because an insurance company called Cardinal did not pay its bills even although the truck owner had paid the premiums and it is deductible. And the truck is about to be seized for a damaged claim. You're about to meet an innocent victim. Now, I don't mean the truck behind me on which it says FHC Transportation Limited, and FHC might well stand in this case for Faith, Hope and Charity. I mean the owner of this truck. I suppose he could be called a real dupe, a, you know, a decent kind of guy who got caught in the most unfortunate circumstances. Who ever heard of an insurance company not paying up in this country in recent years? Well, the guy who is the innocent dupe is a Delta trucker by the name of Doug Lane. Where are you, Doug? Come on in. Tell me, Doug, this used to be your truck. Yes, it did. Now, when was it you had the accident with your truck? January the 2nd this year. Now where did you have the accident? In between Ferndale and Bellingham in the United States. Were you to blame for the accident no, in any way? In no way, no. How much was the damage done to your truck? Just a little over $11,000. $11,000. Now you were unhappy with the accident, but you, you knew or thought you were covered, right? That's right. Yeah. Tell me the story then after. You put the truck in and the adjuster said, OK, fix it. That's right, yes. Anchor equipment went ahead and done a good job. I went down to sea anchor equipment, paid my deductible. How much was that? A thousand dollars, and an extra three hundred and uh, three hundred eighty dollars that I uh, had to pay for that other little jobs. So you paid your thirteen hundred dollars, and at that time you knew that your insurance company was covering the lot. That's right. Yeah. What was the name of your insurance company? Cardinal Insurance. Cardinal. Yes. C A R D I N A L Insurance Company. That's right. Yes. Now you weren't insured in total with ICBC. No, it's just a minimum with ICBC. Yeah, you had your PL plates. and PD for the That's plates. Right. That's right. And then uh, uh, under your arrangements, you had insurance from Cardinal. That's right. So there you were. You paid your thirteen hundred. You got your truck repaired. You picked it up from Anchor Equipment. Then what happened? Then I decided to get out of the trucking business, put the, the truck up for sale. To sell it. That's right. So you put it on a lot. That's right. It was left on the lot. And one day, a friend of mine asked me where my truck was. I said, well, it's at a uh, place in Surrey. So he said, well, it was there. He says, but it's, it's gone from there. So I got on the phone and uh, asked the guy where the truck was. He said, oh, the bailiffs picked it up for the repairs that were done on it. I said, well, Dan, I got the receipt in front of me. I, I mean, you, owed the, you owned that truck outright, didn't That's you? That's right, yeah. As a matter of fact, well, your wife will tell us how you came to own the truck outright, but you owned it outright. That's right. So the bailiffs, on behalf of Anchor Equipment, who were acting properly, they hadn't been paid by your insurance company. That's, that's right. That's it exactly. What had happened to the insurance company? Well, I was informed that they—I was informed that the insurance company had gone broke. But then, when on checking further with them through my lawyer, they tell me that the assets were seized by the federal government for reasons then to me unknown. In other words, there had been an inquiry into Cardinal, their assets were frozen, there are seven million in claims across the country, and you're one of the mugs. That's right, yes. So mugs, you exactly. Thought you were covered and you That's weren't right. covered. That's right, yeah. And now the truck's being sold. Yes. What kind of truck is this, by the way? It's a Mac. Is this what you call an articulated vehicle? Oh, or what? yeah, you'd call it a tractor unit. A Mac tractor unit. What did you pay for it? A little over $30,000. Uh, now it's up for forced sale. That's right. Well, they might get 20 for it. Yeah, if you're lucky, yeah. How much of that 20 will you get back? I doubt if I'll get anything. Well, there's by a... The time they, by the time they've taken, Anchor Equipment's taken their 10,000, and I don't know what the bailiff's fees on it, there won't be, there'll be very, very little left. Then the storage of a few hundred a month. That's right. All through March, April, May, June, July, August. That's right. And September. That's right. Listen, I want to meet your wife. Anne. Can you come over? Anne. Jack. Nice to meet you, but not a very auspicious occasion, no. is it? No, it's not. Now, there's another complication. You bought this truck outright, didn't you? Yes. How did you manage that? We took a second mortgage. On your house? On the house. For how much? Uh, well, I think we got 30000 uh, Just over 30000 Just over 30000 And now you're out the trucking business? Yes. You virtually lost the truck, anyway. Yes. And what about the mortgage payments? Well, I can't make it. It's 850 a month. 
and I've just missed one payment and I'll miss this month's payment. So we stand to lose the house. I stand you know. to lose the home. All because this insurance this. company didn't meet its obligations. Yes, That's right. right. That's Has right. anyone expressed any regrets to you from, say, the Federal Department of Insurance? No. No, no one. No, no. Not a word? No. <laughs> You've, have you lost anything out of the truck in the meantime? Yes. Yeah. There's, there's the chrome caps that's been taken off the truck, and God knows where they're gone. And I had expensive radar, Foxy radar equipment in the truck, and that's gone. You know, it's, it's yeah. just sickening, the whole affair. So you are the innocent victim? That's right. But at the same time, um, everybody who sees your truck, like Rod McIntyre or Anchor Equipment... They'll all benefit out of it. They'll all get their money. But they're doing what they're required That's to do right. legally, legally to protect themselves. That's right, yes. You're the people that got stuck by this cardinal insurance. Yes. That's right. Mm -hmm. Well, I wish you well. Yeah. What Thank else you. can I say? That's yeah. right, yeah. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Jack. I'm at Anchor Heavy Equipment on Goring and Burnaby to prove a point. To prove a point that uh, Doug Lane is, in fact, I mean, really honest, no kidding, an innocent victim in these particular circumstances. And with me are Jack DeWitt and Dick Whelan, who are the owners of Anchor Heavy Equipment. Before we get into the sad details, can you confirm that you repaired his truck after the accident for how much and whether or not he paid the deductible. Yes, we repaired his uh, unit. It was extensively damaged. Uh, the amount was around a ten to eleven thousand dollar figure, and uh, he did pay his deductible. He uh, he paid everything he had to pay, and the rest was up to the insurance company. Now, at that particular time, you were confident, having accepted his deductible, that you were going to be covered by Cardinal. By a check from the insurance company. Yes, that's right. And how was how soon was it before you found out that? There was no coverage. Oh, just, just shortly after the repair was completed, the insurance estimator advised us that Cardinal had had its assets frozen or whatever, and that there would be some difficulty in collecting for the balance of the, uh, of the repair. So that left two groups at that moment out on the limb. First of all, it left Doug Lane out on the limb, and it left you out on the limb because right. you had done the repairs and released the truck, sure That's in the right. faith you were going to get your money. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, was this the only one that you got stuck with with Cardinal? No, we had another smaller one that went bad on us from a few months previously. It wasn't a big repair. It was about three and a half thousand dollars or so. And well, in this, in this insurance industry, if Lane gets stuck uh, and you're stuck, you only have one recourse, don't you? Through a mechanic's lien, we can then take action to have the truck seized and or sold unless unless the uh, lien is discharged by the owner or a representative of the owner. So uh, in view of the fact that Lane wasn't able to come up with the money after his insurance company uh, didn't or couldn't pay, you then very properly exact a mechanics lien. Yes, we were advised that uh, the insurance company was under uh, threat of, uh, of uh, I would say, uh, examination by the federal government. And at that point, we decided to uh, hold the vehicle till an assessment could be carried out. Yeah, and once that he had taken out and was going to sell it himself, but then you perfectly properly seized his vehicle for sale. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, at the moment, to hold it uh, pending results. Pending. And but you can't hold it forever. No, well, uh, I think we've held it now, I believe, for about eight months. Is that? I think that's well, about right. January to yeah. now, yeah, it would be eight months. Three. And nothing's happening. The federal government isn't doing anything about it, or the people that are supposed to be doing anything about it just don't seem to be doing their thing. So uh, when you sell a vehicle as you must, if there's any left over, who gets that? Uh, presumably the owner, after, uh, after all costs against the vehicle are, uh, are paid out. And, uh, and who knows what they'll be now? There'll be storage against it, there'll be bailiff's fees, plus our account, plus interest, and on and on it goes. Um, it could well be that the truck will not bring enough to satisfy all these accounts. So I'm right in saying, and you'll both confirm it, that in this particular case, Doug Lane is an innocent victim of something that happened which caused the Federal Department of Insurance to seize the assets and effectively stop payment of damages on behalf of Cardinal Insurance. Right. That's right, yeah. Well, I hope business, uh, I hope the economy picks up and no more Doug Lanes uh, have to happen. Right. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's true. You would have been an innocent victim too, because I was under the broad impression, perhaps you are, 
that when you deal with a federally chartered insurance company, there are reserves sufficient always to meet the claims. That's what we're told interminably about the ICBC increases. They've got to keep the reserves right so they can meet all outstanding claims. This is not, by the way, the first federally chartered insurance company that's been in trouble. There were a couple of others in Ontario last year. One was called Pitts, the other was called Strathcona. And not only the Doug Lanes and the Anchor Heavy Equipment are involved in this one. There are $7 million in outstanding claims across the country. Perhaps as much, I find out now, as a million dollars in British Columbia. And as I say, it's the adjusters, the body shops, uh, the agents, the legal profession, everybody is left holding the bag. Now, what happened? First of all, there are no funds at the moment to compensate innocent victims. None whatsoever. And Lane will be damned lucky if he gets anything back at the end of a long, miserable period of time as Price Waterhouse uh, wind up, under the Winding Up Act, the affairs of Cardinal Insurance. What had happened was that there was a dispute between Cardinal Insurance Company and their reinsurers, I think they're called Canadian uh, Union of Quebec, over some reinsurance coverage of $3.5 million. And when this came to light, however it came to light, the Federal Inspector of Insurance stepped in, froze the assets, uh, there's supposed to be 20% available for payment, but none of that has come out yet, froze the assets and stopped payment in effect on all outstanding claims. It's not fair. It's not right. Now, these trucking companies have complicated leasing and insurance deals, and they probably get better rates, or thought they got better rates. But, of course, the moment Cardinal was frozen, every policyholder was then in the position of losing the effect of his already paid premiums and had to be guided to rush out and get more substantive, solid insurance. So all kinds of people are affected. I thought that there might have been some interest by local MPs in the plight of Doug Lane, but nobody seems to give a damn. After all, he's only a little trucker. He mortgaged his house to buy the truck. He was covered by insurance, and now he's lost his truck, and he could lose his house. So maybe we can get some West Coast MP to take some interest and nag somebody in the Department of Insurance to see if what monies are available can be freed before the years and years and years of legal ramification are finally, if ever, sorted out. Okay, next this morning, I'm going to talk about, uh, I'm going to go out to UBC and see what we make of the current crop of students registering at our most prestigious academic institution. Lots of people are trying to hide in colleges and universities because of the economy at the moment. At UBC, though, it's much the same crop of academicians and such with education. And I was out there chatting up the youngsters the other day. Yes, yes. <laughs> well, I'll stand, I'll stand in the middle. Beauty and the Beast. <laughs> Name? Colleen Pugh. From? Vancouver. How do you spell it? P-E-W? P-E-W. Welsh. <laughs> the only one in Vancouver. Colleen Pugh. And you? My name's Nicolette Maynardy. And? And Sheila Smith, a good Scottish name. Are you from Vancouver too, Sheila? Yes, I am. Well, now, tell me about your, your university problems. Any um, trouble with the registration? Is it a hassle? Well, not, not, not really. really. Not, if, not if you get an athletic excuse. <laughs> What's an athletic excuse? It's a letter. Um, it's a letter to register early, otherwise your sections are all full and you don't get any of the courses you want. So did you get all the courses you wanted? Yeah, I did. Yep. You did too? Yeah. Yep. Yep. In what, Sheila Smith? Um, I'm registered in theater, so. You which? Theater? I don't know. I never liked you're taking you're taking a degree in theater. Yes. Well, I'm a bit of a ham. I could give you a couple <laughs> <I> of tips, <know. laughs> but you're you will great. get a degree in theater. Yes, yeah, so I will. So your career is going to be aimed in arts and drama, is that no, right? No, not at all. Actually, I want to go into um, into law school, but. I'd already graduated from BCIT, and UBC doesn't accept any credits from BCIT. They're the only one of the few universities that don't. Um, so I couldn't get my degree in commerce, which I'd hoped to. So I took something which I feel um, will be helpful to me. So it gives me a chance to take languages, English, 
It's very good. And kind of broaden your base for a... Definitely. A, don't yes. you think law is kind of oversold at the moment? Too many of them chasing too little business? Very much so, but by the time I get finished my law school, a lot of people would probably have dropped out or gone into different things. And um, How old would you be when you've finished your education? <laughs> 28 and over the hill. <laughs> well, not over the hill, but you'll be 28, so you'll yeah. have been at school since you were six. No, no, I took um, two years out to work. To travel the world? No, to work as a secretary. Did you make money this summer enough to pay your fees? No, I tried getting a job, and um, there weren't really any jobs available for me, even though I can type and, and do all sorts of things. They're just, unless I wanted to work for $800 a month, so I took now, what's us, wrong with $800 a month if you haven't got any money? Well, no, um, I took I took summer school instead. I took two courses, which will help me get through my, my BA faster. Not in danger of you becoming a professional student? Definitely not. You sure? <laughs> Definitely. Nicole, tell me about you. Are you younger than Sheila? Yeah, a couple of years. A couple of years. <laughs> See, not that it shows. <laughs> tell me about you, Nicole. I'm a language major. I'm majoring in Italian. I'm taking fifth year ed when I graduate this year, and I'll be taking fifth year ed after I graduate. Fifth year ed? What is fifth year oh, ed? Oh, it's fifth year education to get my teaching certificate to teach elementary school. Gosh, you see what Van der Zam's doing to the teachers? Yeah, I know, but this, what can I do with an Italian degree? <laughs> Got any suggestions? <laughs> an Italian degree? Well, we could use you down on Joyce Road. <laughs> I'm sure you could. <laughs> now, you've been working this summer. No, I haven't. I went to Mexico for three weeks and kind of took the summer off. <laughs> so you, you've got no student loans? No, I haven't. I don't have time. I, I'm a coxswain for a men's rowing team here at UBC, so... You're I a coxswain for a men's rowing? The yes. Thunderbird Rowing Club? Yes, I am. Is that it? Yeah. Good. You're an athlete too, aren't you? Sort of. <laughs> what soft off? We're kind of the gym, but that's not exactly UBC territory, but um, anyways. <laughs> okay, let me try something else with you. Uh, do you have a political, do you support a political party? Not actively. Which one draws most of your sympathy? Come on. It's, it's hard to say. Come on, come on. <laughs> Well, it's hard to say. Well, if you had to vote tomorrow for either Trudeau or Clark, for whom you, would you or oh, Broadbent, for whom would you vote? Come on. Come on. <laughs> no, no comment. How about you? I'd vote for Trudeau again. Well, I'd Clark didn't last too long. His turn. <laughs> who, who would you? Anything but Trudeau. Anybody but Whatever's Trudeau. Left. Yep. <laughs> I'm not one of you, even a left winger of any kind. Oh, you're not no. a socialist. You're no, not a capitalist. socialist. No, for sure. <laughs> Are there, Gosh, the affluent upbringing has taken away your social conscience. I guess it has. No, 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 no. Sheila, Nicole, and first name again? Colleen. Colleen, thank you very much indeed. Nice to meet you. Very cooperative of you. Bye-bye. My coxswain and a rowing team. Excuse me. And your name? Dave Frank. Dave, you come down a bit and I'll come up with it. All right. Okay. Dave Frank, what year are you in at UBC? Uh, going into uh, four and a half, fifth year. And taking what? Uh, through sciences, physics. How old are you now? We're looking about 21. Oh, wow, you're not a professional student yet, are you? Uh, no, no, I think uh, this year we'll graduate and get into business administration, probably. Yeah, what do you think of the economy? It's falling apart, and it's uh, hurt the students quite badly here, actually. Uh, uh, and that, on the serious side, that must. You wouldn't get any, you wouldn't get any, summer, any summer work this year. Uh, a lot of students didn't. In fact, uh, this year is probably the worst uh, year on record, mm -hmm. by far. Well, and you live on the campus? Um, I live in one of the fraternity houses just about two blocks off campus. Do they still have fraternities? Or still have fraternities. It's, um, Didn't they have a nasty connotation, fraternities? They did, and as a result, they nearly got wiped out in the late 60s. Yeah. But uh, they've been reviving. They're all quite different now. You can't pin one stereotype on all the fraternities. I suppose not. Well, here's another student I want to talk to. Your name, sir? Brad Orlowski. Brad what? Orlowski. Orlowski. Pure bad Ukrainian. Brad, is this your first registration ever? No, it's my fourth year here. Fourth year in what? Arts. Arts. I'm doing a double major in history and political science. What, are you going to be a teacher? Uh, I hope not. Hopefully a lawyer. What do you do? Oh, double major in history and political science. Have you got to get your arts degree before you go into law? You don't have to. I, I could have gone in this year maybe, but uh, I think I'd like to get an arts degree first. So that means three years in arts and how many years in law? Three. Three, so that's no, six years. Four years in arts and, and three years in law. That's seven. seven years before you article. Yeah. So that's eight years right. before you're earning a nickel. That's right. How can you manage, uh, do, you, 
Do we support you during this time, we being the broad back of the taxpayer? No, you don't. We don't support you. Who, Not. <coughs> who supports you? Well, I've, I've been working for the last five years. At what? Weekends and summers. I, I've worked for Crown Saddleback on Fraser Mills in Coquitlam for the last four years. I, I, I recently quit that job, though. IWA rates, though. Oh, yeah, IWA yeah. rates. I've been fortunate enough to have a few uh, jobs down in the docks and stuff, longshoring and, and whatnot, and I've worked this year for a professor on campus. Is it not getting tougher and tougher, perhaps, among your friends, you might know this, to get jobs during the summer to maintain yourself? I don't really think so. I think if, if a person wants to get a job, you, you can find one without difficulty. There are 219,000 people drawing unemployment insurance in British Columbia right now. Well, 219,000. There can't be that many jobs around. Okay, well, I, I think that for most of the people drawing UI right now, at least it's been my personal experience, that I think most of them don't deserve what they're getting. And uh, if I had any control of the ministry that handed out the money to these freeloaders, I'd make them, I'd force them to work, work for the work for their uh, money. You'd, you'd have a means test. Pardon me? You would have a means test, would you? I suppose I'd have to develop something. But I mean, uh, there's a lot of people I know, young people, who, who just have, they have no motivation. And they're not looking for jobs. And they're, they're collecting their five or six hundred dollars a month, which I, which makes me sick because I've been working, you know, for the last four or five years, and I've got a goal in mind. Yeah. And I, here I'm nickel. You know, I don't, ha I don't have much money myself right now. But they're, they're doing nothing. They're sitting back. They're going to the bars and they're collecting a, a healthy wage. For oh, now you're, you're identifying one particular group of youngsters who well, do exist. Where well, they, you get a young couple, both of them have what briefly got unemployment insurance and can live on twelve hundred a month quite nicely. Thank you very well, much. I'm, yeah, I'm identifying identifying young people, but I also know quite a few old, older people, like older. I'm, I'm talking about thirty years old yeah. and so on. Who are drawing a UI and they're quite happy with what they're getting. I mean, nobody wants, sure, nobody wants to go up north and, and, and dig, you know, make roads or dig ditches, but as far as I'm concerned, I don't, I don't want my money, my hard earned money, to go to them to, so that they can earn an uh, easy living. You sound uh, quite politically conscious. Do you have any firm political views? Right wing, of course. Well, <clears throat> embarrassed as I may be, I used to be kind of left wing tending, but now, over the years, I'm kind of leaning more and more to the right so that every year I'm becoming more right wing. I think it was Bernard Shaw who said that if you're not a socialist at 20, you've got no heart, and if you're not a capitalist by 40, you're a failure. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm quickly becoming capitalist, although don't, don't ask me who I'd, who I'd support in, in Canada. Yeah, tell me who you'd vote for federally. Would you get rid of Trudeau? If you could, you know. You think he's a disaster or not? Yeah, I think he is. I mean, what about uh, Joe Clark? I think he's a failure. He's a failure. Trudeau's a disaster. I, in the last election, I voted for the Conservatives, although I, I, with our electoral system, I'm not really voting for anybody because I, I'd rather have the, the, the um, NDP candidate in my constituency rather than the Conservative. Well, Broadbent, he could never become Prime Minister, could he? I hope not. Best of luck. Thanks very much. Okay. Thank I you still don't know what your politics are. Are you well, it's, it's right wing tending, and, and certainly I, no, I support nobody in Canada I, right now. Again, them all. They're too wishy washy. And Bennett, of course, is your hero in BC. Bennett? End of interview. <laughs> <laughs> It seems to me that there is a lack of political identification by youngsters on campuses and youngsters even I meet around the place. Maybe it's true, it's maybe it's not true. How about you, sir? What about me? Political identification. Right wing, as far as you can go. How far right? As right as you can go. Well, don't tell me, okay. Don't tell me jackboots. <laughs> eh? Maybe not quite that far. Well, <laughs> by the way, let's do, we'll come back to that in a moment. Your okay. name? Tom Radford. Tom, what do you do at university here? I'm a physics major. And which year will you be in now? Third. Third year? Yeah. Uh, fair treatment, or do you think this university is full of feather-bedded, tenured professors who should be jacked up a little bit? Uh, which side are we talking? The professional side, or are we talking students here? I'm There's talking a lot of feather beds. Well, let's talk students. about the uh, faculty first of all. Are you happy with the quality of teaching you get from faculty? It's fair. It's fair. Is it good, though? Some's good, some's bad. What about the students? You've been here how many years now? Uh, this is my third. Third year. Do you have a feeling that the students are a lot hungrier and perhaps more dedicated than they were a couple of years ago? Oh, I don't know. Ah, uh, hey, you got the good times, you got the bad times. Mm -hmm. The average age seems to be a little bit older, does it? Oh, it might. Okay, back to politics. Uh, if you were to vote in a provincial election tomorrow, for whom would you vote? Provincial? So good. Supposing WCC candidates run, would you vote for them? No. Well, why not? You said you're a real right winger. Oh, I'm a right winger, but I'm Canadian. Well, that's good to hear anyway. And federally, of course, Tory. You, you'd vote for Joe Clark. You bet. Uncle Joe. Uncle Joe. What do you think of Trudeau? And keep your language clean. <laughs> He's a wise man. He's got the wrong political beliefs. 
Well, nobody really knows what his political beliefs are, <laughs> do they? Eh? That could be true. Uh, but are you active politically on the campus at all? Vocally. Vocally. A little bit of a Webster, kind of loud. I'm not Scotch. Oh, you don't. <laughs> your first name is what? Kevin. Tom. Tom what? Uh, Radford. English. English. Salt of the ass, yeah. pardon me. <laughs> and I won't make any insulting remarks about Limey accents <laughs> like Premier Bennett did. No, he didn't. Didn't quite. Can I help you? Yeah. Uh, top part of your fee statement. May I yes, have your please. name? Emerald Murphy. Murphy Emerald. What are you yeah. doing, Murphy? Well, Murphy a... Emerald used to be a legal secretary, but she's now a, a full-time student, hopefully, if she gets her loan, and is a part-time em... worker. Is it Emerald Murphy or yes. Murphy Emerald? Emerald. It's, my it's Emerald name. Murphy. Right. Now, you do you collect uh, the money from them for the fees here? Yes. Uh, horrendous amounts, or do most of them have student loans of some kind? Uh, well, I can't comment on who decides that they're horrendous. I have my own personal opinion on that, which does not reflect hey. like no, the university policy. No, I mean when the, when the students come here, the, yes. the financing is arranged one way or another. Not necessarily. This year we have an awful lot of students who don't know, in fact, whether they're going to get their student loan. And they're coming here more or less on spec. So they go through, you take note, they've applied for a student loan, or they may have their own money to pay their fees. Right. What would be an average fee now, roughly speaking, for... Uh, for first year arts, we're looking at around $900. In and fees. that's for the whole? That's for the tuition for the, for 10, the entire year. Months. Right. Now, um, what about me? If I wanted to take courses? Well, I don't want to be uh, too nosy, but Please if, do. if you're over 65, uh, there's a good chance that you won't have to pay any fees at all. I mean, if I'm over 65, I could, I could come back here and be, go into, if I could get into a, one of the faculties of law or whatever. Providing that you met the academic requirements. But I'm a mature student. It should take me at face value. <laughs> well, that depends. If you're going into medicine, you still have to oh, have yeah. the science My hand's too shaky for that. But I'm sure you do well in law. Sure I would, but over 65, no fees. As far as I know, that's right. Oh, that's good. Emerald Murphy, Murphy Emerald, thanks very much. And you're, are you back in university too? Full time. Taking what? Asian studies. Asian studies? What are you going to do? Import <laughs> stuff from <laughs> Hong Kong? No, uh, I'm learning all about Japanese political science, which I think is very useful to know if you live in Vancouver and want to get into any kind of foreign trade. Well, as we say in Tokyo, arigato. Arigato. Arigato gozaimasu. Arigato gozaimasu. <laughs> Oh dear! <laughs> My name is Jack Webster. What's yours? Hi. Nelson. Nelson Sprustin. Nelson Sprustin. And your name? Rick Old. Rick, are you both registering here? Yeah. Why are you coming back to university? Um, well, I guess because uh, I enjoyed it last. Oh, I didn't enjoy it, but. <laughs> It How many years now? Which, which year is this? I'm going into the second year of this. In what? In uh, physiology. What's physiology? I don't know what physiology is. No, it's something to do with your body, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's the body and uh, the parts of the body. And how Are you a pre-med student? Yeah. Pre-med student. How about you? I'm going into sciences this year and hoping to switch over to engineering next year, second year. Well, you could, you're old. How old are you? You're quite old. No, I'm 19. Just turned 19. Come off it. You could pass for 29. <laughs> uh, you got lots of money to see you, see you through university yes. this year? Well, this year I, I will, I'll be fine. Will you work in the summer? Yeah, post office. Post office? Yeah. Oh, yeah, you've got the old post office shirt on. <laughs> How much do you make in the post office? Uh, about five grand this summer. Five grand for the summer? Yeah, four months summer. And taxi rides to and from your beat? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Best of luck anyway, thanks for Thank that. Thank you. What are you taking? Education. But you know, Van der Zam is a new education minister and you're wasting your time. I've, I've heard that argument, but I'm, I'm not really familiar with it. I'm sure you can write good. Sure I can write, write good. good. You can write yeah. good. I, I can, just like you speak good. How many years will it take you to get through your degree? Uh, I should be about another couple of years and uh, I, I should be, officially be one year, but... Uh, where are you from? Uh, White Horse, Yukon. White Horse, Yukon. Yeah. Home. Welcome to Big City. Thank you very much. And I tell uh, the Starlight Lounge I was asking for it. Yeah. In Carl Miller's hotel. Carl Miller's? Yeah. You know the tattoo? 
No, I don't know the tattoo. Oh, I thought it'd be more your style. <laughs> nice to meet you. Hi. How about you? You quite happy? Yeah. First year at university? Yeah, that's right. You're taking what? Sciences. From which part of BC? I'm from Vancouver. Well, nice to your name? Beth. Nice to meet you, Beth. Hi. Hi sir. How are you doing? You're Vancouver too? I'm from North Vancouver. North Vancouver? Yeah. First year at UBC? Yeah. Have so you got money to pay for your courses or do you need a loan? Very. Just, I just made it. You just made it <laughs> for cash, though. You made it for cash. Yeah. Uh, I haven't found a left winger student yet. I find. Do you have politics by any chance? No, a little bit. Which side of the spectrum are you on? Right wing. Yeah. Right wing or left wing? I don't know. No idea. Right wing or left wing? Right. Right wing. Yeah. I can't find a left winger in a cardboard lot. <laughs> Enough that I was lucky. A mature student. <laughs> Very mature. Tell me, <laughs> ma'am, right. may I ask your name? And this is Pat Disher. And where are you from, Pat? I'm from Richmond. Richmond. Yes. And are you just starting UBC or is this? No, I've been going at night for several years. And now you're going to register for full-time courses? No, I'm still going at night part-time. What are you taking? I'm an English major. And are you a teacher? No, I work in a college, though, in a library, but I'm not a teacher. So that, but it's really an, an added professional skill for you. Oh, yes, for sure. That's... Thanks very much for Thank speaking you. to me. Thank you. Bye-bye. Here's more of them. How long have you been in the queue? Not too long. Just five minutes? Really? It's not too bad. You all look so young. I'm not so young. You're not so young. Here's another young one. Just no, straight I'm out of high young. school. Yeah, right. No, I've been here for eight years. Been here for eight years? Yes. At university? Mm-hmm. How can you pass eight years here? It's easy. What are you taking? I'm um, master's in commerce. And you? Nursing. Oh, master's in nursing. Name? Elizabeth Hagen. Name? Cheryl Gale. And you only look 21 to me. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so do I. <laughs> yeah, honest to goodness, I can't find one left, a guy with left-wing tendencies. We've How shot about them you? all. We've shot they every shot one of them. Everyone. <laughs> no, no, no. Hello, how are you? Hi. What are you taking this year? Engineering. How many years have you been at UBC? This is my third. Third year. Yeah. Good school? No, that's not too bad, I guess. Not too bad. Uh, would you care to tell me what your political bent is? Uh, yeah, I'm a little bit left of middle. Oh, that's good, but uh, maybe it's not so good if I ask you who you'd vote for in the next federal election and with the same leaders, Trudeau and Clark. I think I'd vote for Broadbent. A little bit left-leaning. What are you taking this year at university? Engineering. And so you're a third or fourth-year student? Yeah. Fourth-year student. Can you afford it this year? Uh, I can't, but my wife is helping out, so yeah, we can. She's working? Yeah. And uh, do you get Canada student loans? No, haven't got one for years. But why, because you didn't ask her because they weren't available? Uh, we made too much money. So you didn't qualify? Yeah. Well, you'll be out prospecting in a couple of years again, eh? Yeah. Mining engineer? No, electrical. In Electric. The in the hospitals. Thanks very much. Yeah. Well, this is the annual mass migration to UBC for registration. I haven't had a look at any of the colleges, really. But uh, 25,000 registering at UBC, and no great complaints. Matter of fact, the students seem a bit kind of placid to me, which is a little bit disappointing. And I'm always asking political questions, and I could only one, find one NDP, and not a Marxist, Leninist, in the bunch. Hi. Hi. Best of luck, whatever you're doing. Thanks. <laughs> Look after the future for me. I'll not be here too long. <laughs> Thanks very much. I think I prefer the rambunctiousness of the 60s and the early 70s. Everybody's looking for a job, everybody's very sober, and everybody's going to hide in academia as long as they can. Next, we're going to have a free-for-all after the break. Before I get down for the free-for-all, I've got to speak to my colleague Clem Chapel in Victoria because there was another election goodie to be dripped out this morning by old Leatherlung Phillips. Don Phillips, that is. But he answers the name of Leatherlungs. <coughs> Clem, what was the big announcement this morning by our government in Victoria? Hardly an election goodie, Jack. The announcement of a completion of an economic study, a very general study about the northwest region of the province. Oh, I thought it was job creation today. No jobs. No, the minister said that there is not one job, not a single job created by his announcement today. What was his announcement? A study of what?
Well, it's a, it's a study of the economic potential of the northwest part of the province, which means that he's saying, well, there are these roads and there are these problems ahead, problems like we'll need people to man the jobs that might take place somewhere in the future. It, it's actually, I've just found a little bit in the stack of paper that we got that says maybe this is a white paper to provide a basic information base and to stimulate discussion on how the northwest should be developed. So, you know, we're talking about 15 years down the, the road, maybe, or 10, or who knows, 20, 30. So this is to tap billions of tons of untouched mineral reserves. This is the old Wenner Grand, grand Scheme. Oh, yeah, the, yeah, or Diefenbaker, or, you know, anything. And oh, they call yes. it, in fact, the New Frontier. Isn't that, isn't that what uh, uh, Diefenbaker once called the, uh, the North, or something like that? No, Diefenbaker was blacktop to every igloo. And uh, when a grand in the old days when W.H.C. Bennett gave him the rights, first of all, up in the Rocky Mountain Trench, and I remember asking him many years ago how he was going to move the, the ore, and he said he was going to build 200-mile-an-hour railroads which would run up and down the tops of the mountains. So this is Don Phillips today announces a 25-year-old dream to conduct a study to tap and organize the mineral resources of the northwest, northwest part of B.C. Yeah, but even less... Winter Grand, I mean, he doesn't even have a Winter Grand to promise to do it. All he's saying is that if a Winter Grand comes along... Well, it sounds like an election goody because they'll be able to say, we are promising. Oh, yeah, it's three NDP ridings as well, you know, Skeena, Atland, and Prince Rupert. That's the Northwest. What do you think, Clam? We're going to get writ this week? Uh, I think next week now. I think he's uh, going to try and judge the effect of all these things. Maybe take a poll over the weekend, a couple of days to study it. And then uh, next week go for broke. That's right, or call the whole thing off if he can stop it by now. 50-50? Oh, at least, at least. Thanks, Clem. I'll see you in Victoria one of these days. I'll disguise myself as a tourist and nobody will know me. Good enough. Much obliged, Clem. You're welcome. One little gem I picked up. This is a little piece of chintzy gossip I really shouldn't give you. But when John Fryer was on the other day, he was talking about the dirty sheet strike. Remember, they pulled the people out of the laundries and in institutions. So I bumped into a senior civil servant the other day in Vancouver. I said, how's it going? Do you like running a a laundry machine when you're called in to fill in for the BCGEU. He said, not bad at all. He said, but I got into trouble uh, the other day. He said, we had done our morning's laundry work and we had another load, so I said to them, let's put in a load while we go for lunch, you know. And one of the supervisors, who was actually a union guy in essential services of some kind, said, hey, don't do that or we won't have any sheets to clean tomorrow. <laughs> I'm in a kind of flippant mood this morning. I know I shouldn't be, but I had a long time off this summer and managing to get back into harness. So I'm going to have a free-for-all and just see what happens. I've got no opinions on anything yet, really. Well, of course I have, but I'll try and hide them for the moment. Go ahead, please. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Uh, I appreciated your uh, comments regarding the uh, UBC. Mm-hmm. Uh, just the other side of the coin uh, regarding... Uh, um, a personal family incident of my son who was in Castlegar last year at uh, college up there. Government canceled the course, applied at Simon Fraser this year, uh, didn't know all summer whether he would make it or not, and on the last uh, few days uh, they advised him that uh, there was no room. By then all the cap uh, colleges and all the other colleges were full. Uh, he's now forced to take his correspondence by, or his uh, schooling by correspondence and hopefully try to find a job. Uh, the thing that, obje that I object to personally as a taxpayer of BC and a parent is the fact that uh, the ratio of uh, people out of province, now don't get me wrong, I'm not biased or bigoted about color or anything else here, but people from out of BC who are there approximate about two thirds of the population of the uh, Simon Fraser as opposed to us taxpayers who have been here all our lives and our kids can't go to school. I think two thirds is high. There were 10% of several of the faculties dominated by people from Southeast Asia. And as I recall, and I'm open to correction on this, they have increased the fees to be paid by out of country students, but not out of province students. Am I right? I don't know, sir. Uh, I'm going entirely on, a, on an unbiased survey that my son did while he was sitting there at a, uh, in a chair waiting to uh, be, served, uh, to be uh, asked some more questions. He sat for a half an hour in a, in a through area, and he counted 46 to 11 of uh, people that were, uh, what should we say, out of province, okay? Well, it's difficult to tell by looks well, nowadays, but I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll find out from SFU's registrar if they have a breakdown on 
out of province well, as well as out of country. Yeah, particularly because when our own uh, kids, who when we're taxpayers and uh, been here all our lives, can't get our kids educated, I, I think that's just a bit much. And yeah, I you appreciate can't, the few minutes you've given me. And sure, welcome back. no problem. You can't close the door on people, but you can have a proper ratio of locals that's to non-locals. That's my point. Much obliged. Thank you. Next call is from Kelowna. Good morning in Kelowna. Good morning, Mr. Webster. Can't hear you. Good morning. That's better. I'd just like to say that I think with the political situation being the way it is, I think our next prime minister should be Jack Webster. Here, here. I shall quit and run at once. Uh, very good. Glad to hear that. Much obliged. <laughs> okay, bye-bye. Thank you very much. Don't know why he's been smoking this morning. Go ahead, please. Hello, Mr. Webster. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, uh, I'm having uh, trouble uh, with the uh, Workmen's Compensation Board. Oh, dear. Now, these are the kind of calls I used to deal with on radio many years ago. They're very difficult. One, standard questions. Is it a back injury? Uh, no, uh, I broke my arm. Uh, have, you and, got a uh, um, ha have you got a union? Uh, no, I don't. Have you been to the advocate at the WCB? I've been to everybody. I've been to Department of Labor, WCB, everybody. Uh, the Royal Canadian Legion, Pacific Command, Workmen's Compensation have you Board, been, have you been uh, through, everybody. Have you been through a medical review panel? Uh, no. What is that? Oh, dear. What's your pension? Pardon me? What's your pension? What's your, what payments are you getting now? Uh, right now, uh, I haven't received anything uh, since uh, I fell and broke my arm. Well, many complications. Leave your number and I'll get one of my people to call you and see if they can give you some common sense help. It's an impossible situation. Tyra, will you take that number? Go ahead, please. I understand that the ESL teachers have to go, the counselors and the psychologists, which make a mishmash of our kids, and 95% of the principals are incompetent. Well, that's a bit of a broad tar brush, but I agree. Oh, but, and also, the teachers are very bad when it comes to supporting their, the other unions within the school system. They will backstab them all the time. Well, they but when they want support, boy, they are hollering. I take strong objection to the commercials that are running at the moment in which they express the fact that their only fear is for the quality of education. I don't accept that. There are problems with Van der Zam just now, though, because as I said to Van der Zam on the air, for the last 15, 20 years, we've allowed the school system to get fat, overloaded, feather-bedded, superintendents coming out of your ears, highly paid librarians in small schools who do next to nothing, and then all of a sudden they come to the crunch, and the government in Victoria made no proper preparation for drastic cuts, which now will happen. So I think everybody's to blame, but I'm inclined to agree that a little fat trimmed off the schools might make the whole system a lot healthier. Yes, and you know, teachers are so bigoted within themselves about the other unions. It, they, well, they're not a union. They're, they don't know what they are. Well, uh, but they will not support the non-teaching staff, which is really pathetic. Thanks, ma'am. Vernon, British Columbia. Yes, good morning, Jack. Morning. Uh, Welcome back, and it's good to see that uh, you're in fine form again. Well, I had a good week last week, what with the Canada, the Monroe, and Bennett, and Fire. I watched and... all of that, and that, that was one, uh, one little point I'd like to bring up with you. I've watched your program now, uh, you know, after work commitments, and uh, it seems to me that you are very, very easy on Mr. Bennett whenever he is on your program. And yet, when the NDP -er comes on, like uh, Mr. Barrett, you uh, and Rosemary Brown, the one time you lean on them with uh, uh, not strong arm force, should I say, but very. Uh, now let me tell you something. Let me tell you a trade secret. The best protection a politician can have against the likes of me and my barbs it's is not long. Fear. No, no, is long-winded evasiveness. Now. When the Premier's here, whoever it is, or any guy who's offered himself a public life, I can't turn around and say to him, oh, for goodness sake, will you shorten your answers? Will you, will you tell me in 25 words or less? And uh, Bennett particularly has a technique of elongating his answers. And I come in as often as I can, and I refuse to plead guilty uh, to being soft on uh, Bennett. That's very well, Jack. But uh, every question that you asked uh, Mr. Bennett last week, he went, all the way around the Mulberry Bush, and he would never come out with a firm statement. 
Well, surely I made that clear. I realize that. What do you want me to do? Be rude well, to him? What I would like you to do you is want get me to Mr. Talk Barrett to him? on there one time and lean on him like you have when you had Mr. Barrett on there. I've leaned on him before and I'll lean on him again, but I refuse to use John Fryer's language. Well, I, I don't want to lose, use that kind of language Much either. obliged. Is Mr. Barrett going to be on there this week? Tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Oh, precisely. Good. I'll be sure to get up and watch it. What do you want me to do? To kiss him off the top? No, I would just like you to, uh, to treat him with the same courtesy you've treated Mr. Barrett. I I, and Davy will be the first to confess <laughs> I've always been polluted. Much obliged. Funny how these people get these silly impressions. Some days I'm tough, some days I'm my usual marshmallow. It depends on the issue and the occasion. How much sleep I've had the night before and how I felt when I got up in the morning. After the break. <laughs> I was wrong uh, when I told that caller there's no differential fees for out-of-Canada students at SFU. It's a 10% limitation on them. They're thinking of dropping it to 7%. There is no limitation on out-of-BC students, nor is there at the moment any count. Now what? Where am I going? Let's go down to this camera. Hi. Hello. Go ahead, please. Yeah, Jack, I'd just like to say that uh, I'd like to see that little mama's boy, Ben, at work for a living. A mama's boy, Bennett. You mean the boy from the country? Yeah. You want to see, what do you want to see him do? Oh, I'd just like to see him uh, quit screwing around and just, you know, do something. He's just, he's just all mouth and no action. Fair enough. That's, uh, how would you vote in a, an election tomorrow? I think I'd go communist. Go communist? Yeah. You're a cynic. He's a cynic. Can't see Fred. You're standing in front of my Q thing. Go ahead, please. Yes, hello, Jack. Yeah. Yeah, I was wondering uh, what kind of truth there was to the rumor that uh, during the Second World War, Pierre Trudeau used to ride around a motorcycle <clears throat> in his hometown, supporting a swastika on his arm. Pierre Elliott Trudeau was not in favor of the British-Anglo-Canadian War. Pierre Elliott Trudeau was at one time a member of the officers' training corps mm -hmm. uh, in uniform, but they separated him because of his failure to accept discipline. At one time, too, he used to attend anti-conscription parades and ride around Montreal in a motorcycle as a young French-Canadian with a Nazi helmet on. I see. Okay. But, however, had you been a young intellectual in Quebec in 1939, you'd have hated the Brits, too. I guess so, yeah. See, it's a question of background. Now, like me, if I told you what I was doing in the early 30s, you'd have me off the air. And I'm not going to tell you. Westwold, go ahead, please. Good morning, Jack. Morning. Two things. First of all, why don't you put an ashtray on that desk instead of us catching you reaching down below that desk for a smoke all the time? And secondly, I think you're going along with this government of ours, your program the other day on the mortgage subsidy. It's just a political carrot for us donkeys because you should turn around and say, hey, this is an announcement. What will happen if this government is called or the legislature is called and this is not passed. You can't apply for this subsidy because nobody knows anything about it except Jack Webster. Legislation has not yet been introduced. The plan itself is not a bad plan. It's a user pay interest free loan which can help a lot of people. What do you want me to do? Just come on and say you're a bunch of liars and thinks and thieves and rotters and scoundrels? This plan will go through if he's, if he's elected or if he put, puts in the legislation. I mean, you can't be that blind. Right. right. But no, you're right. Either, either he's going to introduce it before. Or he's not. Or now, he's not. He's dripping election goodies, and it's a 50-50 chance he'll con an election, and an alert, perceptive person by you, after being fully informed by an alert, perceptive person like me, can make his own rational decision. Okay? God bless you. Go ahead, please. Yeah, Jack? Yeah. Yeah, this is your friend from Brooklyn. How are you? I don't have any friends in Brooklyn. Yeah, sure you do. Hey, Jack, um, when oh. I turn around, they're rolling back all the uh, percentages, hey? They want everybody to turn around and take a roll back in their pay and everything like that. Why don't the MP and the government turn around and take a roll back, give initiative? They got a phony roll back in federal from 11% to 6%. They only get an 11% increase. I personally think that they shouldn't get an increase at all. Go ahead, please. Hi, Jack. Hi. Yeah, I want to talk about this mortgage subsidy. First of all, are you working? Yes, I am. Uh, have you had your wages cut? No. 
Are you covered by a union agreement? Yes. How much do you make an hour? Uh, Twelve fifty-five. Twelve fifty-five. Okay. Now about the mortgage subsidy. Yeah. Okay. I'm an apartment dweller, and I imagine I pay property taxes through my rent and everything like that. You should do. Okay. Uh, I'm not trying to be selfish or anything, but uh, I'm going to be paying for this interest-free loan. Why can't an apartment dweller get a thirty-three hundred dollar a year, year interest-free loan, same as a uh, house owner? I mean. Uh, Twelve. Uh, two, two, I mean, don't go on and say, "Oh, the poor house." No, no, no. I agree with you. All being affected by interest rates. Uh, I bought stocks, and they affected uh, interest rates affected my stocks. But I mean, it's uh, you know, buyer beware, isn't it? You're so, dead uh, right. There is nothing in this for renters. Not a solitary jot or tittle in it for renters. Oh, well, why not? Why can't I get a ten thousand buck three uh, three years uh, free loan? I mean, I think everybody like that, wouldn't they? That's what you're doing to every uh, one segment of the. Well, uh, don't forget that social, yeah, social credit very crafty. And all they are guaranteeing is the 6% percentage point spreads, and they have it secured by a mortgage. Maybe they should give you, take a, a chattel mortgage in your possessions and give you the same deal. That's a very valid point, and I... Well, certainly, if I, hey, if I can get, a, uh, get some money for uh, interest-free for three years, uh, I'd go for that. 260 a month, but you've got to make the total payments on your mortgage in the meantime and then get the kickback. But you make a good point. Go ahead, please. Good morning, Mr. Webster. Morning, ma'am. I wanted to ask a question about this tax-free mortgage subsidy. It seems to me that people will probably have to pay income tax on that because it also seems to me that I remember in Mr. McKechn's budget last fall that these interest-free perks were going to be taxed. Deputy Minister Johnny Johnson told me yesterday that already as a ruling from Ottawa that the interest-free money does not have uh, any tax implications and will not become a benefit to the recipient of the maximum 260 a month. Oh, well, that's great for the people who are going to get it then. Thank you. For them as has, they'll get. Thank you. Right. Go ahead, please. Hello. Hello. Yes, yes. Yes, so I was talking, I was waiting to leave my phone number. Oh, take that number on one, please. Uh, Cobble Hill, that's uh, on Vancouver Island. Go ahead, please. Yes, I'm phoning about the school system. I'm not troubled about some of the programs and all the field trips they're cutting out, but I am troubled about the speech therapy because my children need it. My son's been under, um, he's been on a list for three years, and my daughter for two years, and they're just starting in kindergarten and grade one. And if they can't communicate with others, how are they going to get on in the school system? Well, surely that will not be cut out. No such cuts have yet been made, have they? Um, they've been put on and they say, well, they might not come. That shouldn't be cut. And wait. And now, I got a phone call from uh, Victor School. Where was that? I don't know. Victor School in Victoria, which is handicapped children. And uh, all the teachers' aides are being laid off between now and the end of November. And in that particular school, I believe there are some 50 students and that's going to create considerable hardship. The cuts have got to be done intelligently. You've got to get rid of some of these that's right. administrative teachers by the thousands, or at least shuffle them down the system in some way and keep the essential ones, especially the rehabilitative ones, and I'm with you all the way. Go ahead, please. Hello, Mr. Webster. Mm -hmm. I'd like to speak to you about the school uh, system as well. I think that it would be a good idea to shorten up the summer holidays and add a week or two to the uh, Christmas and spring holidays, whereby uh, the schools would not have to heat the, uh, their buildings for uh, two of the coldest months of the year. That's not a bad idea. Well, all over BC it would add up to quite an amount of money, wouldn't it? Sure would in the interior and in the cold parts of the provinces. Yes. It, it might be a better way to organise the school days. One thing they can't do is shorten the number of tuition days. Oh, I don't want that. I think uh, if they didn't have these union days, or they call them professional days. Well, they're not. They're days off for the teachers. Of course. That's all they are. Five, I believe. But the government gives them, and they're not in the contract, and the government can take it away. Oh. No reason why they can't. Thanks, ma'am. Well, How long have you been here from... I'd like to say, I'd like to see Mr. Van der Zaam as the next Premier. I like yeah. his style. He might be all right after the devastation. <laughs> well, how long have you been here from Australia? Oh, seven years. Seven. How do you like it? Well, um, I do very much, but I'd like it to be a little warmer. <laughs> okay, thank you. What's this? Go ahead, please. Hello. Yeah. Good morning, Jack. Morning. 
I just like to say this. I'm a strong NDP fan, and mm. I'd like to meet Bill Bennett face to face and Hugh Curtis face to face anywhere in Vancouver, anytime. And I'd like to bring up some issues about the social credit government. For example, not too long ago, told BC Railway that they would repay repay them for borrowing more than 500 million to build a branch line to the Northeast Coal Project. And now they turn around and they tell BCR it's no longer sure whether or not uh, they're going to be able to repay him and how. What kind of garbage you call this? Oh, a fair amount of garbage. BC Rail, of course, is bankrupt. You've known that for a long while. Bankrupt. And, you know, uh, not only that, uh, I'd like, to, like you, if you can, question Dave Barrett tomorrow whether or not would he abolish ICBC and bring in the private enterprise, like the private sector insurance companies, because right now I'm in a lengthy hassle of ICBC going to court fighting a case. And uh, due to my age and I guess uh, discrimination and all sorts of other matters, I don't want to get into the big topic about it, but I'd like to see ICBC just well, totally I, abolished. Well, listen, David Barrett will disown you and tear up your membership card. ICBC is the crown in his, is the jewel in his diadem. Yeah, but when he brought it up, I don't think he, it, found he it was a, intending to have it uh, coming he, out like, like the way it is now. No, I didn't intend it to become a massive monopoly, which has probably doubled the costs of repairs in this province. I'm much obliged. You want a break, Fred? And one more quick uh, topic here. Take a few secs. Right. Okay, Curtis said that uh, in the last budget that uh, they will not borrow any money to finance any social programs, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, he also said that the government was going to borrow $26 million to make a loan payment on its outstanding debts. Now, I want, want this quoted. Where did all these debts come from? And Continu why are they borrowing $26 million? And I mean, whose pockets is it going into and who's getting shafted? Well, I'll tell you this. The mortgage subsidy, the interest-free loan for mortgage is going to be backed by the provincial guarantee, and that's going to cost money to some extent, depending on the economy, out of every taxpayer's pocket after the break. I'm about to sail around the world, and Horst Klein, of the president of the BC Lifeboat, Society. Society is going to give me the boat in which I'm going to sail around the world. What are you doing here this morning, Horst? Well, I'm here, Jack, uh, to uh, present you uh, the honorary membership to the BC Lifeboat Society. And I believe it's, uh, we feel it's a privilege, uh, the board of directors thinks it's a privilege to have you uh, for us to be able to do this. Why are you doing it? Because I did a program with you. No, 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 no. Oh, no. This, uh, don't get this confused with some of the government programs where we talk about payola. This is not the case at all. Uh, I, you've been a believer of this uh, for a long time. Yeah, and, back uh, to. And uh, that is, that's our reason for us. Uh, and uh, we also made a real little lifeboat for you, so you have your own little lifeboat. Can you get in on that? Now, I would like you to uh, take notice that in the top you have a little slot there. Now, that is for uh, extra change and all these sort of things when you got some guests on you're your... You're making me a collection agent for the BC Lightboard no, Society. No, That's not really. Doing. No, I'm not doing that at Where's all, Where's my Jack. commission? Yeah, the commission? No, we don't give any but commission. But having put it in the slot, how do you yeah. get out? Oh, well, you turn it upside down and then it comes apart. See, there's already something in it. We primed the pump for you. Well, it's nice of you, and I become a honorary member with my own lifeboat of the BC Lifeboat right. Society, which is a good organization. Now, I hope uh, in the very near future, Jack, I hope that you'll be able to see a lifeboat on the water with your name, oh. speeding to the rescue of some people in distress. I don't even like the water. Well, you don't have to like it, but I think you're doing a very worthwhile uh, thing here. And thank you, Horst. I must finish thank about you. doing thank it. You. Nice of you to come from Penda. Thank you. Go ahead from Parksville. Yes, I'm calling from Parkville. Yeah. I would like to make a comment on what I see happening in these pre-election days, or what I think are pre-election days. Many of the non-voting members of our society are being affected by the restraint program, and I'm directly referring to the children with the education restraints and the dental plan. And many of the voting members are being passed out lots of little goodies. And what a lot of people seem to be forgetting is that the children are our greatest resources. Long after the coal uh, deal is gone or forgotten, 
We'll still have their children, and they're going to be the leaders in our society. And you're telling me that we must vote against social credit? Very definitely so. Thank you, ma'am. Well said, I suppose. Next one. From Seattle. Yes, uh, I was wondering if you're going to do a report on the post intelligence, sir. On the PI? Yeah, the PI. You know, people, I don't even people know. Yeah, that's going to, probably going to merge or not. So it's just going to make the decision. Uh, some people think it's scandalous. I think it's flat. You mean this is the business of uh, melding together the PI and the Times? Yeah. Have they not got permission for that yet? No, they're not going to have permission. As far as they're concerned, they feel that the papers are legal. And yet, I was feeling that somebody should buy the papers to keep the paper a uh, separate voice, two separate voices. In the the Western, Western... And yet, I heard about a couple of days ago, some guy from Australia, somewhere in Boston or New York, bought a newspaper there. And yet, I was feeling that a Canadian, like somebody from the Vancouver Sun, should buy the PI. So you can get Canadian journalists down here and do Canadian and provide journalism. Because I heard Canadian journalists are good, because I watch the CBC News every night. Oh, you just ruined your call. You just ruined your call. Why should we care about the Seattle PI? I'm, maybe well, I, we don't want the paper to merge, because the paper merged, I'm going to lose my job. Oh, you're working for the PI? Yeah. You're a printer? No. A journalist? No. What are you? I'm a phone solicitor. I sell the paper over the phone. Oh, I really do feel sorry for you. Maybe one of these days I can come down to Seattle and do a walkabout about your problems. Eh? Yeah. Thanks for your call. I'm much obliged. Seattle PI. Roya could maybe buy it. Remember Roya, whose brother works for him? First job he gave was to his brother. Go ahead, please. Yes, Jack? Yeah. Uh, I'd like your opinion on something. Uh, we hear all these rollbacks on the big companies. Mm-hmm. But I often wonder, I'm not a union man, when they were really doing good and the shareholders were raking the cream off, they never said to the guys, we're making lots of money, here's a little extra. That's a valid observation, but they go by share earnings in each and every year, and there's no doubt about it that many companies, such as Mac and Blow, are in real trouble now. I'll be back after the break. Davey Barrett was to be on for 90 minutes tomorrow, but I had a previous engagement with another biggie by the name of Ian Sinclair, CPR, who's chairman of Ottawa's Six and Five Committee. So Mr. Barrett will be on first tomorrow morning from 9 until 10, which gives us a full hour. And Ian Sinclair, remember Bennett told him BC wasn't for sale? He's now a kind of PR man for Ottawa on the Six and Five Committee. He'll be on at 10 o'clock tomorrow, starting at 9 a.m. precisely. <laughs>